Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. My name is Charles Dickens. I'm delighted to see you here in this beautiful new church. I first published my book, The Christmas Carol, in 1843, and we've been reading it in England ever since. Tonight we're going to read it for you. And uh, for the past 20 years, we've done it in England. Now we're going to do it in the United States. I must say this is a beautiful new church. Although your floors are creaking a little bit. <laughs> I don't know where you got the wood, but uh, it seems like it's 2017 all of a sudden. <laughs> now it's time for a Christmas carol. I have endeavored in this ghostly little book to raise the ghost of a, an idea which shall not put my readers or audience out of humor with themselves, with each other, with the season, or with me. May it haunt your houses pleasantly and no one wish to end it. Now, come with me to London on December 24th. Marley was dead to begin with. There was no doubt whatever about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and the chief mourner. Scrooge signed it, and Scrooge's name was a good change for anything he chose to put his hand to. Old Marley, was dead as a doornail. Scrooge never painted out old Marley's name. There it stood years afterwards above the warehouse door, Scrooge and Marley. Sometimes people new to the business called Scrooge Scrooge and sometimes Marley, but he answered to both names. It was all the same to him. Oh, but he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone, Scrooge. A squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. Hard and sharp as flint, from which no steel had ever struck out generous fire. Secret and self-contained and solitary as an old oyster. The cold within him froze his own features, <coughs> nipped his pointed nose, shriveled his teeth, Stiffened his gait, made his eyes red, his thin lips blue, and spoke out shrewdly in his grating voice. He carried his own temperature always about with him. He iced his office on the dog days and didn't thaw at one degree at Christmas. Nobody stopped him on the streets to say, My dear Scrooge, how are you? No beggars asked him to bestow a trifle. No children asked him what it was o'clock. No man or woman ever once in his life inquired the way to thus and thus, a place of Scrooge. Once upon a time, of all good days in the year, on Christmas Eve, old Ebenezer Scrooge, member of the firm of Scrooge, Marley and Company, sat busy in his counting house. It was cold, bleak, biting weather and he could hear the people in the court outside go wheezing up and down, beating their hands upon their breasts and stamping their feet upon the pavement to keep warm. The city clocks had just gone three, but it was quite dark already, and the candles were glaring in the windows of the neighboring offices, like ruddy smears upon the brown hair. A Merry Christmas, Uncle Scrooge. Bah! Humbug. Christmas a humbug? Oh, surely you don't mean that. I do. What reason have you to be merry? You're poor enough. Well, come then. What reason have you to be dismal? You're rich enough. Bah! Humbug. Don't be cross, Uncle. Oh, 
Well, what else can I be when I live in such a world of fools as this? Merry Christmas. Out on Merry Christmas. What's Christmas time to you but a time to pay bills without money, a time for finding yourself a year older but not an hour richer, a time for balancing your books and every, having every item presented dead against you? If I could work my will, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. Uncle! Oh, nephew! Keep Christmas in your own way and let me keep it in mine. Keep it? But you don't keep it. Well, let me leave it alone then. Much good it may do you, much good it has ever done you. There are many things from which I might have derived good from which I have not profited. Christmas among the rest. I have always thought of Christmas as a, a, a good time, a kind, generous, forgiving, charitable time. A time when men and women seem to open their shut up hearts freely and to think of other people as fellow passengers to the grave. Therefore, uncle, though it has never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, I think it has done me good, and will do me good, and I say, God bless it. Oh, you're quite a powerful speaker, sir. I no wonder you don't go to Parliament. <laughs> Come dine with us tomorrow. <laughs> but why? Oh, why did you get married? Because I fell in love. Oh, because you fell in love. Huh. Good afternoon. Nay, uncle. You never came to see me before that happened. Why well, use it as a reason not to come now? Good afternoon. I want nothing from you. I ask nothing of you. Why can we not be friends? Good afternoon. I am sorry with all my heart to find you so resolute. But I'll keep my Christmas cheer to the end. So, Merry Christmas, Uncle Screw. Good afternoon. Scrooge and Marley's, I believe. Have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Mr. Marley has been has been dead these seven years. He died seven years ago this very night. We have no doubt his liberality is well represented by his surviving partner. At this festive season of the year, Mr. Scrooge, it is more than usually desirable that we should make some slight provision for the poor and destitute who suffer greatly at this present time. Many thousands are in want of common accessories. Hundreds of thousands are in want of common comforts, sir. Are there no prisons? Plenty of prisons. And the union workhouses, are they still in operation? They are. <coughs> still, I wish I could say they were not. The treadmill and the poor law? Both very busy, sir. I'm glad to hear it. They scarcely furnish Christian cheer of mind or body to the multitude. A few of us are endeavoring to raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of warmth. We chose this time because it is a time of all others when want is keenly felt and abundance rejoices. What shall we put you down for, sir? No. You wish to remain anonymous? I wish to be left alone. But since you ask me what I wish, fine folk, that is my answer. I don't make merry myself at Christmas, and I can't afford to make idle people merry. I help to support the establishment I have mentioned. They cost enough, and those who are badly off must go there. But many can't go there, and many would rather die. Well, oh, oh, if they would rather die, they had better do it, and decrease the surplus population. <laughs> Besides, it is not my business. It is enough, of a man, enough for a man to understand his own business and not to interfere with other people's. Mine occupies me <coughs> constantly. Good afternoon. The fog and darkness thickened so that people ran about with flaring lamps, offering their services to go before horses and carriages and conduct them on their way. The cold became intense. Foggier yet and cooler. The door of Scrooge's counting house was open that he might keep an eye upon his faithful but shivering Clark, Bob Cratchit, 
when a dismal, cold cell below was copying letters. <coughs> Suddenly, Bob Cratchit rose and approached the office of the school. Well, out with it. Uh, well, what are you standing there for? Well, sir, my fire is almost out. And I thought another bit of coal would keep it going. Nonsense! Haven't I told you I won't have you burning up my coal like, like tinder? Yes, yes, sir. Well, why don't you go back to your work? Well, sir, tomorrow's Christmas and... Ah, oh, yes, I know. You were wondering whether you could have all day <coughs> off, I suppose. If, if quite convenient, sir. Well, it's not convenient. And it's not fair. If I was to stop a half crown for it, you'd think yourself ill used, I'll be bound. Yes, sir. But, Christmas! Nothing but a poor excuse to pick a man's pocket every December 25th. Huh. My old partner, Marley, agreed well with me. He thought of a lot of humbug, too. And you, a clerk with 15 shillings a week and a wife and family, huh. talking about a merry Christmas. Bah! May I have tomorrow off, sir? <laughs> Well, I suppose you must, but be here all the earlier the next morning. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, I will, and thank you, sir. After such a disturbing afternoon, Scrooge took his melancholy dinner in his usual melancholy tavern, and having read all the melancholy newspapers and beguiled the rest of the evening with his banker's book, he went home to bed. He lived in chambers which had once belonged to his ir irascible old partner, Marley, a gloomy suite of rooms, old and dreary, where no one lived but Scrooge, the other rooms having been let out as offices. Once in his apartment, he closed and locked his door, and in his usual fashion, he put on his dressing gown and slippers and sat down before the fire to take his evening gruel. The fire was very low indeed casting eerie shadows on the walls. And he was obliged to sit close to it and brood over it before he could extract any warmth <coughs> from it. As he leaned forward in his chair, his glance happened to rest on a bell, a disused bell that hung in the room and communicated for some purpose long forgotten with the chamber in the highest story of the building. It was with great astonishment and a strange dread, that as he looked, he saw this bell begin to swing, first softly, then so loudly that every bell in the house joined in and rang also. It must have lasted for half a minute or so, but to Scrooge, it seemed a terrifying hour. The bell ceased, only to be followed by a clanging noise deep down below. As if some person was dragging a heavy chain over the castle and the land through the cellar. Scrooge then remembered that ghosts upon houses were described as dragging chains. Then followed a series of strange sounds as of feet mounting on stairs, coming closer and closer toward his room. Scrooge suddenly aware some weird happening was about to occur, hugged his shivering body, and waited in fear and trembling. Uh, I know you could do it not. How now? What do you want with me? Much. Who are you? Ask me who I was. Uh, who were you then? In life, I was your partner, Jacob Marley. Can, can you sit down? I can. Well, well then do it then. You don't believe in me. I don't know what, I don't know what to You know what evidence would you have of my reality beyond your own senses? I don't know. Why doubt your senses? Oh, well, oh, because a little thing affects them. A, a slight disorder of the stomach uh, makes them cheat. Uh, you may be a bit of, um, just a bit of beef, a, a bit of a blot of mustard, a, a crumb of cheese, a, a, a fragment of underdone potato. Uh, there is more of gravy than of the grave of you, whatever you are. Ah! Oh! Oh! Dreadful apparition, why do you trouble me? Man of worldly mind, do you believe in me or not? I do. I must. Uh, but, but why do spirits walk in the earth, and why do they come to me? It is 
required of every man that the spirit within him should walk abroad among the fellow men. And if that spirit not go forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death. It is doomed to wander through the world. Oh, woe is me! And witness what it cannot share, but might have shared on earth and turn to happiness. You, you are fettered, why? I wear the chain I forged in life. I made it link by link, yard by yard. And I girded it on of my own free will, and of my own free will I wore it. Would you know the weight of the strong coil you bear yourself? It was full as heavy of this seven Christmas Eves ago. You have labored on it since. It is indeed a ponderous chain. Jacob, old Jacob Marley, tell me more. Speak comfort to me, Jacob. I have none to give. I cannot rest. I cannot stay. I cannot linger anywhere. In life, my spirit never roved beyond the narrow limits of our money-changing hall. But, but you were always a good man of business, Jacob. Business? Mankind was my business. Charity, mercy, forbearance, and benevolence were all my business. At this time of year, I suffer most. Why did I walk through crowds of fellow beings with my eyes turned down and never raised them up to that blessed star which led the wise men to the stable. Were there no poor homes to which its light would have conducted me? Hear me, my time is nearly gone. I, I will, but, 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 but don't be too hard on me, Jacob. I'm here to warn you that you have yet a chance and a hope of escaping my fate, a chance and hope arranged by me, Ebenezer. Oh, you were always a good friend to me, Jacob. You will be haunted by three spirits. I, I, I think I'd rather not. Without their visits, you cannot hope to shun the path I tread. Expect the first tomorrow, when the bell tolls one. Could I not take them all at once and, and have it over, Jacob? Expect the second on the next night at the same hour. The third upon the next night, when the last stroke of twelve has ceased to vibrate. Look to see me no more for your own sake. Remember what has passed between us. Slowly and quietly, the specter floated out upon the dark, bleak night, leaving Scrooge desperate with curiosity behind. After a moment, he followed and went to the window and looked out. The air was filled with phantoms wandering hither and thither in a restless haste and moaning as they went. Every one of them wore chains like Marley's ghost. Many he knew personally. Old friends who'd passed on, business acquaintances, all bound and fettered and wailing in mournful dirge. He had been quite familiar with one old ghost in a white waistcoat with a monstrous iron safe attached to his ankle, who cried piteously at being unable to assist a wretched woman whom he saw in the doorstep below. The misery of them was all clear, that they fought to help in human matters and had lost the power forever. With a painful sigh, Scrooge closed the window and examined the door by which the ghost had entered. It was double locked, just as he had locked it in the early evening. He tried to say humble, but stopped at the first syllable, and feeling much in need of repose, went straight to bed and fell asleep in an instant. Subconsciously, from deep in the realms of sleep, old Scrooge heard the clock toll the quarter hour and the half hour and remembered that the ghost had warned him of a visitation on the stroke of one. <clears throat> Recalling this, he dozed fitfully. On the instant of one, as he lay there, the light flashed up in the room. For a moment he blinked, then stared wide-eyed at what he saw before him. Oh, 
Are you the spirit whose coming was foretold me? I am. Oh, who and, and what are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past. Long past? No, your past. Oh, well, what then? What, what would you of me? Rise and walk with me. Oh, I am mortal and I will fall. Nay, my hand will support thee. Look beyond. What do you see? Oh, good heaven. I see. I see. I, why, I was a boy here. I remember this well. Your lip is trembling. What is that upon your cheek? Lead on, spirit. I follow. You recollect the way? Remember it? Of oh, the path of my boyhood? Oh, I could walk it blindfold. Strange to have forgotten it for so many years. Strange. But let us go on. Ah, a school. Do you remember? But of course you do. Even though it is Christmas Eve, however, it is not quite deserted. A solitary child, neglected by his friends, is left there still. Oh, I know him all too well. My own lost boyhood. My lonely self. You recall this old brick schoolhouse with its weathercock and the school bell hanging from its roof? Look now. The walls are damp and mossy, the windows broken, the gates decayed. Let us look within at the boy who still reads near the feeble fire. Oh, poor boy. Poor lonely boy. It was on that day my little sister Fan came with the happy news she had persuaded my father to let me come home for Christmas. I had thought I was to spend it alone at school. How she clapped her tiny hands and, and laughed when she told me that she had sent a, he had sent a coach to fetch me, that we might all have a Merry Christmas together. Did you go? Oh, yes, merrily with the, my trunk tied on top of the chaise, oh, and the quick wheels of dashing through the snow. Your sister was always a delicate creature whom a, a, a breath might have withered, but she had a large heart. Oh, so she had. You're right. I, I will not gainsay it, Spirit. She died a woman and had, I think, one child. Yes. My nephew, Fred. Shall we leave the boy at his desk? My poor forgotten self, as I used to be. Poor boy. What say you? Oh, I wish uh, it's too late now. What is too late? Nothing. I, well, last night, uh, a boy was singing a Christmas carol at my door. I, I should like to have given him something, that's all. Let us see another Christmas. And so the spirit of Christmas past led old Scrooge down the memories of long ago, each separate experience recalling moments quite forgotten. Although they had but just one, just left the school behind them, they were now in the busy thoroughfares of a city. It was again Christmas time, but it was evening and the streets were lighted up. The ghost stopped at a certain warehouse door and asked Scrooge if he knew it. Know it? Why, I was apprenticed here. <laughs> the joy of reunion came over him as he saw his old employer sitting behind a high desk in a Welsh wig. Why? It's old Fezziwig! Bless his heart! Old Fezziwig alive again! As he watched, he saw the memories of that Christmas Eve suddenly come into being. The clearing of the warehouse floor for dancing. The fiddler perched on Fezziwig's high desk. The beaming face of Mrs. Fezziwig. And the laughter of twenty couples all dancing at once. Himself, a young lad of eighteen, laughing with the rest. On the stroke of eleven, the party ended, and everyone <coughs> wished each other a Merry Christmas in high, ringing voices. Spirit, what power we have to render others happy or unhappy. The power of words and deeds, as great as it cost a fortune. Alas. What's the matter? Oh, nothing in particular. Just, just now I should like to be able to say a word to my clerk, Bob Cratchit, that's all. Once again, Scrooge and the ghost stood side by side in the open air. My time grows short. Look! 
Scrooge looked, this time seeing himself as a man in the prime of life. He was not alone, but sat by the side of a fair young girl in mourning dress, in whose eyes were tears which sparkled in the light that shone forth from the ghost of Christmas past. It matters little to you, very little. Another idol has displaced me, and if it can cheer and comfort you, as I would have tried to do, I have no just cause to grieve. What idol has displaced you? A golden one. This is the even-handed dealing of the world. There is nothing on which the world is so hard as poverty, and yet there is nothing it professes to condemn with such severity as the pursuit of wealth. Poor Ebenezer, you fear the world too much. All your other hopes have merged into the one hope of being beyond the chance of its sordid reproach, the reproach of poverty. I have seen your nobler aspirations fall, one by one, until the master passion gain engrosses you. Have I not? What then? Even if I had grown so much wiser, what then? I'm not changed toward you, am I? Our contract is an old one, made when we were both poor and content to be so, until in good season we could improve our worldly fortune by our patient industry. You are changed. When it was made, Ebenezer, you were another man. I was a boy. Your own feelings tell you you are not the same. I am. That which promised happiness when we were one in heart is fraught with misery now that we are two. How often and keenly I have thought this, I will not say. It is enough that I have thought it and can release you. Have I sought release? In words. No, never. In what then? In a changed nature, in an altered spirit, in everything that made my love of any worth or value in your sight. If this had never been before us, tell me, would you seek me out and try to win me now? No. You think not? I would gladly think otherwise if I could. Heaven knows I would. But if you were free today, tomorrow, can you believe that you would choose a dowerless girl? You, who in every confidence with her weigh everything by name. Or even if you should, do I not now know that regret would surely follow? I do, and I release you with a full heart of the love for whom you once were. May you be happy in the life that you've chosen. Oh, spirit, show me no more. Conduct me home. Why do you delight to torture me? One shadow more. Oh, no more. No more. I don't wish to see it. But the relentless ghost pinioned him in both arms and forced him to observe what happened next. They were in another scene and place, a room, not very large and handsome, but full of comfort and Christmas cheer. Near to the winter fire sat a mother and daughter, so alike in their loveliness that Scrooge caught his breath to think that the comely matron might once have called him husband, and that another such creature, quite as graceful as her mother, might have called him father, and been a springtime in the haggard winter of his life. As he watched, a knocking was heard at the door, and such a rush ensued, the younger children just in from play to greet the father who had arrived, laden with toys and Christmas presents. After the excitement quieted down, the master of the house sat by his own fireside, his daughter leaning fondly on him, and his wife close by, making a picture of contentment and domestic happiness. Scrooge could stand no more. Spirit, remove me from this place. I cannot bear it. Leave me. Take me back. Haunt me no longer. In his anguish, he wrestled with the spirit of Christmas past, and yet found he was only struggling with a strange, unbroken light. He was conscious of being exhausted and drowsy, and of being in his own bedroom, with barely time to reel to bed before he sank into a heavy sleep. At the stroke of one, Scrooge awoke in the middle of a prodigious snore and sat upright. He knew that the second messenger dispatched to him through Jacob Marley's intervention would shortly present itself. And he wished this time to challenge the spirit 
the moment of its appearance. However, no spirit came. Five minutes, ten minutes passed until the clocks proclaimed the hour and he still sat alone. At last he began to think. Throughout the hour, he had seen a ghostly light about the clock and wondered if in the adjoining room he would find its weird source. He had hardly moved when a strange voice called him by name and bade him enter. He obeyed. It was his own room, there was no doubt about that, but it had undergone a surprising transformation. The walls and ceiling were so hung with living green that it looked like a perfect grove, from every part of which glistened gleaming berries. It was as Christmassy a sight as old Scrooge had ever seen. Come in, come in, and know me better, man. I am the ghost of Christmas present. Spirit on me. Spirit, conduct me where you will. Uh, I went forth last night on compulsion, and I learned a lesson which is working now. Tonight, if you have aught to teach me, let me profit by it. Touch my robe. Come. Now, but see you. Oh, I see gaiety and, and Christmas cheer everywhere. Oh, stores lighted up, and holly, and mistletoe. That noise. Do you know whose house that is? Oh, oh yes. It's the humble home of my clerk, Bob Cratchit. Look, spirit, how, how happy they are. The, the children dancing about the table while Mrs. Cratchit lays the feast before them. Whatever is, is keeping Father and, and Tiny Tim? I don't know where they are, Mother, but I'm glad they know, Mother. Why, bless your heart, you're alive. But my dear, how late you are. We had a deal of work to finish up last night and had to clear away this morning, Mother. Well, never mind, so long as you are here. <clears throat> and here comes Tiny Tim with his father. And I'm donning at least three feet of comforter that came down before me, and that's not coming to fringe. I've darned and brushed my threadbare clothes to look seasonable, of course. And on top of all this, I've got Tiny Tim upon my shoulder. And then, uh, how did how did Tiny Tim behave? What, was he good? <laughs> as good as gold and better. Somehow he gets thoughtful, sitting by himself so much, and thinks the strangest things you've ever heard. He told me. I hope that people saw me in the church, because I am a cripple, and it might be pleasant to them to remember who it was that made lame beggars walk and blind men see. At last the dishes were set on, and grace was said. At the end of the meal, Mrs. Cratchit presented a most wonderful pudding. You know, I regard this pudding as the greatest success achieved by Mrs. Cratchit in our whole marriage. Now the weight is off my mind. I had doubts about the quantity of flour. At last, the dinner was all done, the cloth cleared, the hearth swept, and the fire made up. Then all the Cratchit family drew around the hearth in what Bob Cratchit called a circle, meaning half of one. And at Bob Cratchit's elbow stood the family display of glass, two tumblers, and a custard cup without a handle. Then Bob held up the custard cup and proposed, A Merry Christmas to us all, my dears. God bless us. To which Tiny Tim re-echoed, God bless us, everyone. There was nothing of high mark in this. The Cratchits were not a handsome family. They were not well dressed. Their shoes were far from being waterproof. Their clothes were scanty and Bob's might have known the inside of a pawnbroker's. But they were happy, grateful, pleased with one another, and contented with the time. At last, Scrooge could no longer be without an answer to his question. Spirit, Spirit, tell me, will, will Tiny Tim live? <coughs> I see a vacant seat in the poor chimney corner, and a crutch without an owner, carefully preserved. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, the child will die. No, 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 spirit. Say, say he will live to be spared. Why so? 
If he be like to die, he had better do it and decrease the surplus population. Man, if man you be in heart, will you decide what man shall live, what man shall die? It may be in the sight of heaven you are more worthless and less fit to live than millions like this poor man's child. <sighs> this truth you speak? Enough. We must go on. Hold my robe. What now, man, see you? I, I see my nephew with his family. Oh, dear, how heartily they, he laughs and how they join him. What else? Oh, they joke about me. They drink to my health and happiness, knowing that I lack both. Yet they laugh that I miss the dinner they offer it, and yet, in truth, they, they seem to wish for my presence. You observe well. Oh, the games they play. Oh, I remember them. I leave you. My life on this globe is very brief. Uh, our spirit's lives are short. Mine ends tonight at midnight. Hark, the time is drawing near. Oh, man, look there. The spirit drew Scrooge's attention to a boy and a girl, ragged, scowling, and wolfish, but prostrate, too, in their humility. Where graceful youth should have filled their features out, a stale and shriveled hand had pinched and twisted them and pulled them into shreds. Where angels might have sat enthroned, devils lurked. Spirit! These children, are they yours? They are man's. This boy is ignorance. This girl is want. Beware them both, for on their brows is written doom, unless the writing be erased. Have they no refuge or resource? <laughs> are there no prisons? <laughs> are there no workhouses? <laughs> Scrooge was now more fearful than ever. <clears throat> the clock chimed in the background, and once again, Scrooge was confronted with another story, <coughs> one who was silent. I, I am the presence of the ghost of Christmas yet to come. You are about to show me the shadows of things that have not happened, but will happen in the time before us. Oh, is that so? The ghost of the future, I, I fear you more than any specter I have seen. But I know your purpose is to do me good, and as I hope to be another man from what I was, I am prepared to bear you company and, and do it with a thankful heart. Will you not speak to me? Lead on, lead on, spirit. Oh, I hear voices, men and women, Talking of one another, one of one, talking of one who, who is dead. Oof, they rejoice in his death and speak with cold dislike. They quarrel over his possessions, and even the sheets from his bed and the curtains from his windows. Oh, they've even taken the shirt from his dead body. Oh, spirit, spirit, just with horror, I, I witness this. I see, I see, the case of this unhappy man might be my own. I beg you, let me see some tenderness connected with death, uh, that, uh, that I may forget the horror of what I have just heard. I pray you, be on. According to Scrooge's wish, the ghost of Christmas yet to come conducted for him the second time to the house of his poor clerk and found Mrs. Cratchit and all the little Cratchits seated, still as statues, around the fire. But Tiny Tim was nowhere in sight. As they watched, the door opened, and Bob Cratchit, Cratchit entered wearily. They all greeted him, eager to bear him comfort, and gave him fresh tea from the hob. After a while, he placed his arm around the shoulders of his wife and, calling his children together, ascended the stairs to where Tiny Tim lay, 
cold and still in his little bed. I wish you could have seen how green the place is. It would have done you good, my dear. But you'll see it often. I promised him we'd come and see him on, on each Sunday. Don't be sorrowful, Robert. He is where all the little angels go. And we must be happy this Christmas, as he would have us. Of course we must. We must be closer than ever before and, and happier. But however, and whenever we part from one another, I am sure we shall none of us forget Tiny Tim, shall we? Or this parting that there was among us. No, never, Father. And I know, my children, that when we recollect how patient and mild he was, though he was a little, little boy, we shall not quarrel easily among ourselves and forget Tiny Tim and doing it. You know, I never, Father. I'm very happy, my dear, for him and for us all. Once again, the silent ghost of Christmas yet to come beckoned Scrooge to follow, first leading him past the window of his own counting house that he might attend. Scrooge hastened to see what the future held for him there, but saw nothing that he recognized. It was an office as before, but not his. Another had taken his place and sat at the desk, which had been his for so many years. He bowed his head that he might erase the sight. The phantom beckoned him on, pointing as before, this time to an old churchyard, overrun with grass and weeds, forgotten and untended. The spirit stood among the graves and pointed solemnly to one. Spirit. Before I draw nearer to that stone to which you point, answer me one question. Are these the shadows of things that will be, or are they shadows of things that only may be? Men's courses will foreshadow certain ends, no doubt, but if these courses be departed from, the ends will change. Say it is thus with what you show me. I beg you, take, say it. With that, the ghost of Christmas yet to come again pointed to the grave. Scrooge crept towards it and read the words carved in the stone. Tis my name carved in the stone. Am I the man whose death those men and women welcomed, over whose possessions they quarreled? No, spirit, oh no, no, spirit, hear me. I'm not the, I'm not the man I was. I will not be the man I must have been, but for this intervention. Why show me this if I am past all hope? Good spirit, your hand trembles. Your nature intercedes for me and pities me. Assure me that I may yet change these shadows that you have shown me by an altered life. I will live in the past, the present, and the future. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. Oh. In his agony, old Scrooge caught the spectral hand. It sought to free itself, but he was strong in his entreaty and detained it. The spirit, stronger yet, repulsed him. Holding up his hands in a last prayer to have his fate reversed, he saw a sudden alteration in the phantom's hood and dress. It shrunk, collapsed, and dwindled until his hands clasped nothing but emptiness. The ghost of Christmas yet to come had left him. I, I will honor Christmas in my heart and try to keep it all year. Oh, tell me, I may sponge away the writing on the stone. I beg you, tell me. With a dreadful start, Scrooge awoke.
Why, it's Christmas Day, sir. It's Christmas Day. Oh, I haven't missed it then. The spirits have done it all in one night. Oh, oh they can do anything they like. Oh, 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 of course they can. Of course they can. Wait, hello, I find out. Do you know the pulpers in the next street at the corner? Yes, I should hope I know it, sir. Oh, an intelligent boy, a remarkable boy. Uh, do you know whether they sold the prize turkey that was hanging up there? Uh, not the little prize turkey, but the big one. The one as big as me. Yes, yes, that's the one. It's hanging there right now. Oh, well, go and buy it. Go and buy the turkey? All oh, right, sir. Oh, oh, oh no, no, I, I am in earnest, my child. Uh, go buy it and bring it back, and, and I'll give you a shilling. Uh, bring it back in uh, uh, ten minutes, and I'll give you a half crown. Uh, uh, now, uh, off you go. Uh, uh, I'll send it to Bob Cratchit's. Yes, he shan't know who sent it. Oh, why, it must be twice the size of Tiny Tim. <laughs> the students went downstairs. By now, the people of the town were pouring forth, eager to share in the holiday spirit. Scrooge had not gone far, but coming on towards him, he beheld the gentleman and gentlewoman who had walked into his counting house the day before. Oh, my dear madam, uh, how do you do? Mr. Scrooge? Uh, yes, that is my name, and I fear it may not be pleasant to you. Uh, allow me to ask your pardon, and will you have the goodness to accept a donation from me? <laughs> Mr. Scrooge, are you serious? Uh, oh, uh, quite, uh, please. Um, and if I may, a favor from you. My dear sir, I don't know what to say to such generosity. Please, madam, do not say anything. Please. In the afternoon, Scrooge turned his steps first to his nephew's home, where he went with affection and was received with a happy welcome. The next day, Scrooge was waiting at his desk when Bob Cratchit arrived at the counting house. In fact, Scrooge was sure to arrive early with the very hope that he would catch Bob Cratchit coming in late. What? What do you mean, coming in late? Uh, I'm sorry, sir. I am running a little late today. I'm sorry, sir. You are? Oh, yeah, yes, you are. Uh, step this way, please, if you please. Now. It's only once a year, sir, and it shall not be repeated. Uh, I was making kind of merry yesterday, you see, sir, and, and you see, someone sent the biggest turkey I've ever seen to our house, and... and All right, now I'll tell you what, Cratchit. I'm not going to stand for this any longer. Therefore, I'm about to raise your salary. <laughs> yes, therefore, a very Christmas, Bob, a merrier Christmas than I've ever given you Christmas before. And Bob, um, I, I will, uh, <laughs> and you have never to assist your struggling family and will discuss your affairs this very afternoon. Oh, now make up the fires and buy another coal scuttle before you dull another eye, Bob Cratchit. <laughs> Scrooge was better than his words. He did it all and infinitely more. And to Tiny Tim, who did not die, he became a good a friend, as good a master, and as good a man as the good old city knew, or any good old city, town, or borough in the good old world. And it was always said of him that he knew how to creep, keep Christmas well, if any man alive possessed the knowledge. May that truly be said of us and all of us. And as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us, everyone. <laughs>
Um, we please uh, join us all at the parlor next door for uh, some tea, and I think we have some wine and some other refreshments, and we'll all celebrate Christmas together here in December 2nd, 1867, in the new church, St. Mark's. Thank you.